are holed up in a, a, a rare, quiet place at E3 with uh, the good doctors of Bioware, uh, Greg Zeschuk and, and Ray Muzika. Thank you guys very much for uh, taking a few minutes out with us. So um, this chair is really... I'm having fun. This, I'm having fun here. Um, so I guess I'd just like to talk to you guys about the, the general state of the Bioware empire, which uh, seems to be expanding by the day. Um, so you guys are showing Mass Effect 2. Finally, you know, full-on gameplay, just actually demoing it here at E3. Uh, so I feel like you guys set up, like, a, a bunch of teases with the fiction, you know, with the, the trailers you guys were putting out, you know, especially with Shepard, you know, killed in action and all this stuff. And you guys have kind of kind of reneged on that a little bit at this at this show. Can you explain, like, what was the thinking behind those teases? I mean, do you guys just like playing with our emotions, or, or how did that come about? Well, I think the, uh, you know, clearly, you know, you're seeing Shepard in demos here, but, you know, it's not, it's not you know... You, you probably heard during the demo if you did get a chance to see it, and, and then you heard that I mean the impact of what you can do in the game can actually literally kill off your characters. And so there, there's scenarios and situations which might lead to bad outcomes um, for for your player and for Shepard. So really, what we're what we're trying to do is is you know really catch people's attention, but also you know in fact warn them that Mass Effect 2 is a very dangerous game, and uh, to play you got to really you know be thoughtful about the consequences of what you do, and you know, bad things can happen. It definitely seems like a much grittier game. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's the whole, you know, kind of dark second act thing, you know, just kind of classical sort of dramatic setup. Uh, that was, I guess that was like a conscious decision going in, right? I mean, did you guys set out saying, like, this is the one where all the bad stuff happens? Well, it's almost like we were trying to amp the intensity up, you know, across the board and the, the way the dialogue works, the way the narrative flow works, the combat, you know, kind of make it really feel like a shooter RPG. So we really... We really wanted to, to, to amp all, all that up and make it feel like a dark second act where there was choices and consequences and, and moment to moment really intensity, you know, both in the combat and the, the way the exploration and the, and the dialogue and, and narrative flow work. Uh, but as Greg said, this is, this is an intense game. It's got dark choices. Uh, you're, you're Commander Shepard. You, you know, you're, you're, it's a whole new kind of um, experience in terms of there's an ominous threat that's threatening all organic life in the galaxy. You've got to gather really what amounts to a suicide squad of, of sort of the most badass villains, criminals, masterminds across the galaxy. You gotta get the, you know, we're showing, uh, revealing one of the characters, a new character, a new race actually, alien race, uh, guy, the guy's name is Thane. He's the best assassin in the galaxy. You need people like that on your team to repulse the, uh, and, and repel the, or this, this threat, this, uh, you know, ominous menace uh, to, to humanity and, and really the whole galaxy. I think another thing too is, you know, when you think about just how, how the game has played out so far, uh, Mass Effect 1 was that, you know, joy of discovery, the, the, the new idyllic world where, you know, you, you went and everything seemed nice and clean and it was all good, but I think the second game was where you, you kind of figure out what's really going on in the galaxy and you start seeing that seamy underbelly and, you, you know, it's, it, everything's not as it seems and, and, you know, a lot of bad things happen. Um, so, the first game had, I, I, it, it was a very satisfying kind of core storyline. The narrative progression and the places you went following the story were great, but the, the periphery you know, so there were some complaints about you know lack of variety. You know, a lot of the planets kind of kind of looked not. I, I know it's hard to believe, but uh, no, ha- so we've taken that feedback to heart. Like one of the things we're doing is the uncharted worlds are all handcrafted and exotic, and, and they feel really, really interesting and really worthwhile to go to. They're optional content still, but they're going to enhance the main story arc, and maybe they're a clue to if you if you invest a lot of time and in, in backstory of your characters, kind of making sure that your your team is as powerful as possible. Maybe they're a clue to actually be able to succeed more and be more effective in the main story arc and that's definitely uh, something I think players are going to enjoy so if you choose to do those Uncharted Worlds now you're going to have a great time doing them but they're still optional and they're going to make the main story even better yeah it's definitely a better payoff very cool so uh, <clears throat> this is kind of apocryphal but we have heard from some developers that Microsoft is not a big fan of you know one game accessing another game's save data and all that kind of thing but you guys are really you know that that's kind of sounds like an integral feature of Mass Effect 2 you know because you made some big decisions in the first game that are going to carry over did you guys have to kind of push the boundaries with Microsoft to get them to let you sort of access that save data? I mean, is this something that we haven't really seen in a game before? Well, I mean, you know, it's funny. I mean, because we've had that question a couple of times. I mean, we, on the PC side, have done this many times before. Mm-hmm. You go all the way back to Baldur's Gate, you can use the same save game through. And I think, you know, the tradition of some of these really story-driven games is to extend it across multiple games. And right from the beginning when we made, you know, decided, hey, Mass Effect's going to be a trilogy, you know, that was one of the features. And I don't think, I don't think Microsoft's got anything against it. It's more a function of, hey, when do we get to this? When, you know, it's, a lot of times it's who's asking for it. I mean, people aren't asking for it. It's not necessarily a feature they're going to support. It's one of the standard, you know, Xbox features. And now we're we're asking for it. And I mean, we believe there's an army of fans that would like to see it too. And so it's you know it'll, it'll happen and it'll work out really good. Cool. So um, obviously the game's not going to be out this year. 
I think it's safe to say at this point. Two? Yeah. yeah, early next year. So, so it is an early next year game. I was just, I'm, I was curious because, I mean, Mass Effect strikes me as a big enough tent pole that is kind of a traditional holiday sort of release. But you feel that the, the, the franchise is strong enough to stand on its own in kind of a no, very earlier much. release window. Yeah, I think uh, our goal is to make it an, an experience that's incredibly intense, really high quality. It's going to take all the feedback we received on Mass Effect One and just amp it up in every dimension, like the combat, the the dialogue, and the narrative flow, the exploration, the Uncharted worlds, Titan Mako controls, better a- AI for enemies, lock the frame rate at thirty, and make texture loading like really seamless and smooth. Elevators are faster than ever, so you know there's a lot of great things we're taking to heart and making the experience freaking awesome. Well, I don't know if I can wait another year, but uh, you can play I'll it at the show. do my best. You can actually go and play it at the show. I, I might have to go look into that. Uh, so let's, let's talk about uh, the Old Republic a little bit. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't been to our LucasArts appointment yet, so I haven't seen what's being shown, but could you guys just kind of briefly characterize how much of the game you're showing to, to attendees here? Yeah, we're, what we'll be doing is we'll be taking them through a live demo. I mean, connect it back. It's connected back to our Austin server. So again, real gameplay, the real stuff. Showing them a couple different character classes, a couple different planets and scenarios, and actually taking them through one of the really big things in the game, which is the choice. So, you know, in, in usual MMOs, there's really no sense of choice. The guy asks you to go get the five gold rings, you'll get the five gold rings. There's no discussion. You know, you can actually have a discussion, and not only that, decide to bump off the guy with the five, ask him for the five gold rings and take his magic bag, for example. Um, um, these aren't scenarios that are in Star Wars. Just to be right. clear, no golden rings, no magic bags. Those are just um, purely illustrative. Those are in my mind, just these stories. But but just just the, the ability to make a choice. I mean, actually, what, what there is, I mean, there's a, a point where you can, there's the captain. The captain's been kind of a rascal, and you're sent there to clean up the mess, and you get the, the choice of either killing him or saving him. And then actually, depending on what you do, an entire different chunk of the game opens up. And this is fundamentally different than what we've typically seen in any MMO. Um, that combined with the you know, full voiceover, digital acting, just kind of like what you've seen in Mass Effect, really, really brings the players into it, makes the whole thing a lot more meaningful. So, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, a, lot of, a lot of the gameplay, a lot of the character stuff, we take you through a, a really good idea of what some of the characters are like, and finally, you know, showing you choice and showing you real good story in an MMO. It's very exciting. Cool. So part of telling that story, uh, you guys announced this week that it's going to be fully voiced, just every, I assume that, that means every single line of dialogue, right, in the entire yeah, game? Absolutely, yeah. So... Can you talk any numbers? I mean, how many lines of dialogue is that? You said that this may Hundreds be... Hundreds of thousands. This is one of the, the biggest voiceover projects pretty much in history, yeah, yeah. right? We, we don't know. It's hard to know exactly, but it, it certainly seems like it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, for games and maybe all forms of entertainment. Um, and, you know, that's that's we think it's going to change everything. Like, MMOs are going to be different from that, from this point on. This, this MMO changes the landscape uh, because it's got story and choice, as Greg described, and meaningful choices. That actually, there's no save game here. You have to move forward. You have to live with your consequences of your choice, and people are going to react in the game accordingly, so that's really cool. And the fact that it's all voiced means the characters feel that much more rich and detailed and alive, so that, that's a whole new pillar that, you know, there's been certainly there's been story in, in uh, MMOs before, but this is enhancing that and just kind of taking it to a different, whole new level. And it's not losing anything in the translation, the progression, the customization, and you know, rich exploration and Star Wars universe, which is pretty damn cool. And great combat, you know, with force wielding characters and lightsabers and you know, bounty hunters and all kinds of cool characters are inspired by the great archetypal classes in the movies. They're all in there too. So you've got a strong foundation of the stuff that MMO players love. And you know, you're playing with your friends online. You can solo it. You can, you know, basically the answer is you're pretty much just going to have every kind of feature that you'd imagine in an MMO and great story beyond that too. That's my favorite song, by the way. <laughs> that's that's the Greg Zestrick theme song you're going to be hearing. It follows you wherever you go. It's, it's, it's actually, it's <laughs> it's actually a happy na- song. It's nap time now. <laughs> we, we have to go. It's okay. nap time. Everybody, spread your towel out on the floor. Uh, so just if, if they can hear it, it'd be it's pretty special. Uh, so uh, just uh, one more. That's very cute. It, it is. It's lulling me into a trance. Um, <laughs> it's the it's like the A song. Right, right. Um, so <laughs> I don't think it's going to stop either. So, <laughs> oh my. Um, Good times. Let's go continue. Indeed. So uh, one more question on the VO. Uh, having, having played a lot of Kotor myself, uh, how much of, of this voice dialogue is going to be alien language, and how many of those samples are going to be the same sample that you heard from another alien in the past? I'm sure you guys kind of remember what I might be getting at. 
<laughs> yeah. No, actually, they're, 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 we, the cool thing, I mean, we are we are seriously investing in an enormous amount of alien mm-hmm. dialogue as well. It's actually there are thousands of speaking. Yeah, about, like it's it's really really remarkable. Um, because I think, I mean, the folks at LucasArts, this is something they've done a lot. And I think, you know, with, certainly with Knights of the Little Republic, it was, you know, I think we, we, we made it, we put these lines in, and we didn't really know what the impact would be. I mean, one thing it really allowed us to do, which was really cool, was to actually use those lines as, as a way for us to, when we were kind of doing that final Bioware touch where we modify the story. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, they were used a lot. But, I mean, you know, we're blowing it out really wide with lots of different variety. <laughs> the song's beginning again, so suggest there's interviews over soon. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, re- really actually just... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it'll be good. Okay, very, very cool. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll I'll cut the short. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys. Um, thanks, thank you. Um, we just uh, we just wanted to ask you collectively as an organization if you're if you're planning to give the person who cuts your trailers a raise anytime soon because coming out of EA the other day. Like you guys have probably like the top three trailers at this whole thing, so thank you. I don't, I don't know, I don't know, like who's cutting those things, if it's a group effort or what. But like, there's there's some really talented that. people in our in our marketing team and our art team in general at the developments, you know, as teams. And I, I think we're blessed to work with such great people at all levels of the org. Cool. Very cool. All right. Well, clearly it is uh, it's time to <laughs> uh, put this Bye-bye, interview to children. bed. So good night. <laughs> Sleep you. tight and <laughs> don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did that work for you? I, I, that was awesome. I think, I think that might end, up, it might end up being one of the funniest interviews. <laughs> like, like, that is going to be, like, hilarious. Like, is, is like the nap time one? What is that music? <laughs> oh, no, that's oh, music. Like, like, what is it? Oh. <laughs>